Um, I'm Lori Taranishi. I'm the founder and CEO of IQ360. We're a communications uh, consulting firm based in Honolulu, Hawaii. And we, my work focuses a lot on ESG, environmental, social, and governance topics. And today, uh, we have our, an esteemed panel, I can't wait to introduce them, here to talk about leadership in our times. And um, wow, what a crazy two and a half years it's been. And it seems like the next two and a half years might be crazy as well. Um, I mentioned to some people that, you know, I, I feel like we're living in this VUCA world. And by the way, I'm breaking my cardinal rule. I always tell my clients do not use acronyms. And I'm using ESG and VUCA today, so I apologize ahead of time. But the reason that um, I like this word VUCA, it refers to, it's an acronym for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And I think that VUCA perfectly describes the situation we find ourselves in today. And so if everything seems to be moving faster with more uncertainty, uh, it's because we're living in this VUCA world. And um, this is happening in part because of computing uh, power, digital communications, and social media, which are uh, accelerants and multipliers. I mean, many of us grew up with 10 or 20 TV channels, and now uh, you know we can't even count the number of channels we have to get content. Um, so organizations are implementing ESG to help them reach their goals while, you know, um, at the same time dealing with disruptions at a pace we've never seen before. Um, so we're dealing with all kinds of issues. The war in Ukraine was mentioned earlier today, Black Lives Matter in the U.S., uh, economic disruptions, environmental disasters, and increasing technological change. So today I want to focus on what is required of leaders in this environment um, before the value of companies was determined by hard assets, how much land you own, how many factories you had. But today, in the digital world, human capital in, and, um, is really the focus and managing reputation. So in this digitally enabled VUCA, VUCA world, what stakeholders perceive about you and your organization is often as critical as your products and services. So ESG really offers us um, a model of showcasing an organization's preparedness for and leadership in this VUCA world. So our three outstanding panelists will share how they lead their organizations in this volatile uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment. And I'm gonna sit back down and introduce each one of them. Can you still hear me? Mm -mm. Okay. So first on my left is Jasper Chung. He is the president of Amazon Japan. Mm -hmm. And Jasper joined Amazon after more than 10 years of corporate finance experience in companies in Asia and North uh, America. He began his career in uh, at Amazon as finance director uh, in December 20, 2000 <laughs> and was named president in 2016. And under his leadership, Amazon Japan has significantly expanded the selection and convenient services it offers customers. So Jasper, welcome. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> Next is Suyoshi Nick Nagano. He's the chairman of the board of Tokyo Marine and Vice Chair of Keiran, the Japanese Business Federation. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Nagano joined uh, Tokyo Marine and Nichiro Fire Insurance in 1975 and has held a variety of positions, including um, assignments in the Los Angeles office and in corporate planning. Um, he has a very long list of accomplishments, uh, was appointed president and CEO of Tokyo Marine Holdings in 2013 and chairman of Tokyo Marine and uh, Group CEO in 2016. He's uh, leading uh, his company and their vision to become a good company, and I'll let him explain a little bit more about that, but it's very inspirational, um, and has assumed his current role as chairman of the board, uh, which he did in 2019. So, Lori, thank Nagano. you very much for your introduction. Okay. Also inviting me as a panel today. My name is Tsuyoshi Nagano. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we have Dana Heatherton. She's the head of emerging markets of Waymo, uh, the leader in autonomous driving technology. Uh, this was formerly the Google self-driving project. Um, so for those of us in, who 
are in the Bay Area. We see those Google cars. Uh, prior to Waymo, she served as COO for Gig Car Share, which was the nation's largest free-floating car share and all EV fleet. And in 2020, she was named the top 20 to the top 20 most influential women in the mobility list. And she's an advisor to the Women's Startup Lab. So we're very happy to have Dina. Thank you so much for having me. So I don't know. I think none of you heard of VUCA either. I, I was thinking it was a really <laughs> cool buzzword. But <laughs> since I put it out there, um, can you tell me, as leader of your company, what keeps you up at night? And in this VUCA world, what is the toughest challenge you face? And how are you addressing it? I'm going to start with Jasper, since he's here to my left. Oh, great. Well, thank you. Um, it's indeed my first time to actually hear about the term VUCA. Um, on the other hand, as I was listening to you, Laurie, um, I was thinking that you know, over the last 25 years or so since our company was founded, uh, we're considered a, a disruptor um, to the whole uh, place, uh, including the internet itself. So in many ways that uh, we have actually been living in this uh, VUCA uh, phase for a long, long time now. Uh, we actually are causing some of those VUCA stuff um, as kind of like over the last uh, 20 some odd years as well. So in that sense, it's not really kind of like that new uh, in, as, a, uh, as a scenario for us. Uh, on the other hand, we also know that you know, the fact that we are part of the disruption does not mean that we won't be disrupted. Um, so it is important that for us to actually continue to be focusing on our long-term view. Um, ever since we actually started the company, that our mission has always been, that has never changed, is to be the Earth's most customer-centric company. Um, and recently, we actually added to that um, to be the Earth's uh, best employer as well. Um, and those two things really work extremely uh, dearly to our hearts to say that, you know, that's, that's the North Stars that we have and that's what we want to be doing, regardless of what the short-term sort of like disruptions might be. We know that if we actually can continue to focus on that North Star uh, and do the very best that we can actually get closer to that every single day, uh, we think that we're going to be actually delivering the, the best value to uh, the society that we actually serve. Um, so what we are concerned about the, uh, the short-term sort of like changes, and we've been through that, like uh, from our startup phase to the Lehman Brothers to you know, the current state and of changes. Uh, so we actually pay a lot of attention to those. Um, but, and we're actually making like very, we, we, we make sure that we ourselves are very agile um, and be actually responsive to these changes, but not to the extent that we actually remove our, ourselves away from the broad direction of our, our vision and the mission. One of the things that we actually consider to uh, continue to actually remind ourselves is this whole thing we call the day one culture, uh, whereby every single day is a new day for us. Um, we may have actually successes or even failures in the past, but that will not actually stop us from going forward towards the missions that we have. And that means that we actually continue to be very uh, curious about what the future looks like to us, what these changes actually will mean to us, what uh, adaptive changes we need to be making, um, and last but not least, is kind of like learn from our failures and be actually be brave enough to em embrace such failures that we can actually continue to be moving uh, the company forward such that we can actually eventually reach that uh, mission that we have. Uh, day one is, is a very important thing for us, especially when we actually become so big over the last 25 years. And if that's one thing that actually keeps me uh, awake at night is whether or not we're actually keeping ourselves as a day one company and whether or not I personally am doing enough to actually cause that to happen or not let us become a day two company. Okay, great. That's really interesting. So Nick, can I ask you, Me? how are you no, um, addressing much, yeah, the again, uncertainty? Thank you. I'm very much looking forward to talking leadership you know, today with a young leader such as Lori, Jasper, <laughs> and Dana. And I hope that I will get young Young power from all of you, <laughs> and get at least 10 years younger at the end of this conference. <laughs> and uh, by the way, as uh, we have a simultaneous translation between English and Japanese today, so I may use Japanese sometimes when I couldn't find the right words in English to answer. So in this case, please don't be relaxed, okay? And keep <laughs> translation equipment all the time. <laughs> 
Thank you. So uh, thank you for your first question. And the first of all, nine years uh, has passed since I assumed the role of CEO, but I have never had a sleepless night. <laughs> I think I'm quite tough, both physically and mentally. No, I'm just kidding, so. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that the most important thing for leader is not only you know, era of the booker, but also any time, is uh, to create a good corporate culture that you know, fosters employees and organizations that challenge with a sense of purpose, which can be the starting point of why we exist and what we are doing business for. So what I was CEO, I spent uh, the most time focusing on creating the culture. Since, uh, as you're aware, uh, insurance company is, you know, do not have the pro uh, product tangible, like uh, cars or electric car goods. So insurance companies sell the trust that we will be there to help and uh, protect customers in their needs. So trust is created by people. So this is the reason why insurance company, insurance business is called our people's business. Again, our purpose is to protect customers and society in their needs. So it's truly important for us to act in line with this purpose and to understand the right cycle of uh, getting the trust of our customers leads to profit. This is very important, I think. So the starting point of right cycle is people. So we must think carefully how to motivate them. So it is easy to say in words, but it is very difficult to incorporate this sense of purpose into our organization and our daily operation. However, Many companies just pursue profit. And if this company keep going it, pursuing profit itself seems to be the purpose. So if this is the case, the organization will seek action to increase just profit, so which will not motivate employees and cannot be sustainable. So most importantly, we will not get the trust from customers and societies. So I saw many uh, bad examples in both countries, especially in our financial industries. But profit is the result of right action and means to achieve our purpose. So I often say profit is like air. Air is essential as we will die without air. However, we are not born to breathe air. So the same is true for companies. Profit is essential as companies cannot sustainably continue the business without profit. However, companies do not exist, exist to make a profit. So again, it is very important to recognize that profit is the means to achieve the purpose of the company. There is no other side. So Tokyo Marine Group operates in 46 countries around the world and has more than 40,000 employees. When I should do to encourage our 40,000 employees, what, what should I do? What should I do to encourage our 40,000 employees to act with the sense of purpose I mentioned now? In order to do that, it is essential to create opportunities for dialogue and to persistently communicate thoughts and principles and belief of top management as many times as possible. Tone at the top is critical. It's a kind of a timeless endeavor. So I presented the universal goal vision to be a good company and have been trying to explain what is the most important things for the company, what we value, what the company was existed for, the story of profit is like air, as I mentioned, and also how each employee's work and the company's purpose are connected. And I actually have uh, conducted this dialogue with more than 20,000 people 
not only in Japan, but also you know, other countries around the world. However, creating this culture is a never-ending journey. So once we feel we have become a good company, we can't move forward anymore. It's the end to exit. So as I mentioned at the beginning, creating a culture is the toughest and most challenging thing for a leader, but it's the most important job for a leader. So I talk a bit wrong, no. but <laughs> this is my answer. Wow, I think that Nick could be a philosopher. I mean, it's very profound what you said. Mm -hmm. um, so Dana, what do you think about all of, both actually Jasper and Nick spoke about culture, the importance mm -hmm. of culture and connecting a company's purpose to employees as a means to win trust. Yeah. Um, what do you think about operating in this uncertain time? Well, Nick, as you hope to get 10 years younger, I hope to get 10 years wiser on this <laughs> panel. Um, I am sitting beside the giants here and I, I am sharing a young female leader's perspective and, uh, and a US perspective. Uh, and what we're seeing today is the great resignation. It is happening. I do think things are changing. Um, there are layoffs happening. But I think that underlying urge to find purpose and mission is, is there regardless. And I think what concerns me most is retention, especially when we're a dynamic autonomous vehicle car company. Every day is so fragile. And so we need to retain our employees. Um, but the playbooks that we've used in the past are not appropriate today and they're not effective. And so, you know, Google kind of created the, um, the perks playbook. We're gonna put ping pong tables in the office. We're gonna have gourmet food. And we are trying to get people back to the office today and there's no amount of free beer or ping pong tables that is going <laughs> to change, change that. People are looking for purpose and mission and they wanna to belong to something that is solving a societal problem. And so, uh, kind of personally, um, earlier this year, my, my father suffered a, a severe stroke, and uh, Google has incredible benefits. And I scrolled through so many pages trying to find what I could do to help my dad in this situation. I have incredible health insurance. He did not. And I would have done anything to swap that. And I'm scrolling through, seeing how I could get free Pilates and free massages and... Uh, and, and I finally saw something where it said, you can extend your insurance to your parents. And I clicked again, and I saw it was only in Google Japan. And that's when I realized, um, it, it makes me frustrated when I hear um, a lot of rhetoric about Japan is not innovative. Japan is not capitalistic enough. There are so many things that we could learn from Japan. And right now, in this moment of crisis, this is such an opportunity to borrow from what is happening in an aging society. We have millennials that are being asked to take care of elderly parents, and I have no idea how to do that. And so I think tactically, if we think about, reassess our benefits packages, see how we can actually meet employees where they are at today. You ask me what's keeping me up at night. There are a lot of things at work. There's email, but I have a baby. I have an eight-year-old and a baby, and that keeps me up at night. And probably one of the hardest things I have to do every week, besides meetings all day long, is figure out, what do I make for dinner? It's so embarrassing to say that. But um, if a company can come and meet me uh, at where I'm at today, I would be so much more productive, because that's one less thing I would have to think about. So I think there's an opportunity for us to reassess how we are giving perks to our employees. But the second thing, I think, doesn't cost any money at all, um, but it is the hardest to do. And it is what Nick and what Jasper is saying is you have to look deep down and dig what is your purpose, what is your meaning for being here, because people don't want to just be part of a company. They want to make the world a better place. So even if you're just making shoelaces, it's how are you doing it? How are you doing it in a way that's generous, that's respectful to people and the environment? 
And unfortunately, it's cheaper to buy ping pong tables. It's easier to do that rather than stop and reassess and think about what is it that we're here for and clearly articulate that so you can inspire a generation because there's no amount of money that's going to make people feel inspired to come and work their butt off every day. <laughs> oh, that's very well said, Dana. And I think and when you look at all the data and of the surveys that are out there, um, of millennials, you know, Gen Z, um, those feelings about wanting to connect to purpose um, are only going to get stronger. So for all of us that are Gen Xers or boomers, you know, we really have to, I believe, stop saying, why don't they work as hard as we do <laughs> like the way we did? Because that's not the way of the world. And actually, when you look at the trends of, of climate change and some of the really, really difficult challenges that are going to face us, if we don't adopt that mindset, I think we are actually going to be the dinosaurs, dinosaur corporations of today. So I, I really appreciate all of your comments, and I also appreciate, Dana, what you said about learning from each other. Yeah. Um, so let me just uh, explore this topic of retention a little bit more. I mean, you know, Jasper, let me, I'm sorry to start with you again, but <laughs> I'm... Problem. Kind of, I'm here kind of to spread it, it around. <laughs> he told me I can be bossy with him too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, in the past, companies have defined success um, as meeting the expectations of, of investors or customers. Um, but as Dana said, that now a, a critical risk factor is retention of talent. I mean, human capital. So many are saying that's that's one of their greatest concerns and. You know, yeah. there's also an activist element yeah. to these younger workers. So not only do they want to connect to companies' purpose, they're going to call you out on the carpet if you do the wrong thing. I mean, they have chat rooms, right, at Amazon, at Google. <laughs> I don't know about Tokyo Marine, but I know <laughs> that there's, you know, ways for employees to complain about things to each other. So how... <laughs> have you have you shifted your thinking or your role or how do you describe or can you describe how these changes um, affect the way you lead? Mm. Yes, um, the way that I start uh, answering the question is that um, we have always been operating on a set of principles uh, we call the leadership principles with, uh, in Amazon. And uh, we started with like customer obsession being the first one because uh, it ties back to the Earth's most customer-centric company, all the way to like you know currently we have like 16 of us uh, of them now. Um, one of which has always been extremely important for us is uh, hire and develop the best. Um, has always been from day one um, all the way to today, uh, especially for my. Uh, personal experience that when we actually started uh, here in 2000, uh, 22 years ago, um, when everything just seemed to be so hard um, that we, don't, we didn't have the financial resources, uh, the business model didn't quite work in Japan and all those kinds of things. And uh, you know, I asked myself, so what, what would be the one thing that I can actually do to focus my, my energy to actually make this work? And the only answer that I actually found helpful yeah was to focus on the people. Hmm. It's actually hire and develop the best, because that's the only way that you can actually scale uh, an operation. So as a result, I actually spent like 80, 85% of my time just kind of doing that, um, and just kind of focusing on what hire and develop the best actually means on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's exactly how actually you know, uh, attract uh, candidates, how to actually talk to our existing employees, understands what their purposes are, uh, actually whether or not they actually even fit what the Amazon was supposed to become, um, all those kinds of things. So for me, it's kind of like a personal experience through that particular journey to say like, you know, focusing and really kind of like driving all my energy towards that is one of the most important and most sustainable success factors, if you will. Now, fast forward to today that, you know, given uh, what you just described, uh, Laurie, that you know, we also found that uh, hiring development best itself is good, but it's not good enough. Uh, we have not actually understood or described our way to mm. interact with each other. We just kind of developed like good people and great leaders. That's, that's wonderful. But we did not actually describe how we actually interact with each other. Mm. Um, and we found that, you know, the whole notion about uh, diversity, 
um, and inclusion is extremely important for us that we have not really kind of paid too much attention to in the past, let's say, like 15 years. Um, and within that, we actually found the importance of like empathy, uh, psychological safety, uh, like critical, critical elements mm -hmm. for us actually to become the Earth's best employers. And in many cases, we found ourselves insufficient in that regard. Mm -hmm. We did not quite know, you know what empathy actually means. It's not a day-to-day -day vocabulary that are actually used in the office or in our you know, online calls. Um, and we certainly did not quite understand what, in, we sort of understand what diversity can mean, but we didn't quite know what inclusion really kind of like can mean. Um, so we're actually on this journey to kind of like figure that out, <laughs> uh, to say like, what does that actually mean to us? So we're actually getting a lot of work in there to start like talking to our employees a lot more. We're changing our, you know, so like the boss behavior that each one of us might have from time to time, especially under some sort of like pressure that we actually feel. Uh, we want to be a lot more conscious about that conversation. We want to be a lot more in other people's shoes uh, when we actually do that. The good news, however, is that you know, when we actually think about that in the context of our broad mission to be the Earth's most customer-centric company, it actually is no different from what, how we actually think about serving our broad customer set. Now, all, it, we always want to actually understand what the customers actually want. Uh, we listen to their feedback. There's never a complaint from the customers because every single complaint is a piece of feedback. And that's a gift to us. It's a free gift. And it's all about us receiving that properly. And so when, when we actually think about that and apply it to our employees, that actually makes complete sense to us to say how we actually kind of think about employees in that same context. Mm -hmm. um, and say, like, when, we, when, when there's a feedback that we receive as a gift, and how that actually re reflected in our policies, in our thinking, uh, in the perks, um, and things like that, um, that we can really kind of move ourselves towards that. And to be the Earth's most customer-centric company in the context of uh, employees, turn it into the, uh, to be the Earth's best employer. Um, and that's what we actually added to our mission statement. Oh, that's so you kind of explained why you added that second element to also be the world's best yes. employer. It's just interesting. You talked a lot about empathy, and you're, I'm just surprised at how much we're talking about feelings <laughs> on this panel, which is really refreshing and interesting. Um, so, Dina, what do you think yeah, about you. all of this? I was just oh, oh, Jasper, I'm sorry, Jasper. Oh. Or, uh, oh. Sorry, Nick. As Jasper mentioned, uh, very uh, important things. I think uh, human capital is a key word on these topics. And I'd like to touch up on a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> what kind of organization is strong? I believe that there is nothing more sustainable and stronger than an organization supported by self-help of employees. So in other words, we need to create a bottom-up organization where everyone who fully understands the company's purpose leads anything. So therefore, leader's job is to bring out uh, the bottom-up by top-down and to align the growth of both of company and employees. As I mentioned earlier, our business is people business. So I think that we value the people as greatest asset in our industry. For example, at Tokyo Marine and Tokyo Marine Institute of Fire Insurance Company in Japan, we have decided to provide a flat monthly payment of 20,000 yen. It's about 150 now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to all employees as my challenge incentive from this year. So this incentive is intended to support employees in taking on the challenge of changing not only the way they work, but also various other aspects, such as learning and studying to achieve growth for the company and for themselves. So we believe this is truly an example of investment in people. If we look at Japan as a whole, wages for Japanese people have unfortunately remained at the same level over the past 30 years. Can you believe it? 
This is why it is called the lost 30 years. On the other hand, if we look at the level of returns to shareholders during this period, how do you think? It has increased about 10 times. So this is a kind of shocking fact for me. So this disparity, you may not know, but the disparity is expanding in Japan now, and I think that the shareholders' capitalism must be having an adverse effect. So as I talked before, we need to go back to the purpose of company and business as starting point now more than ever. So shareholders are one of the important stakeholders, but we are not doing business just for them. However, how to return the company's profit to stakeholders in balanced manner is a very difficult question to answer. So I have recently been thinking that the both of management and investors needs to seriously address these issues as a long term, based upon long term. In other words, the question is how to create sustainable and win-win relationship among stakeholders. So business does not end after five or 10 years. The company can solve social issues using commercial means and all stakeholders must be aware of needs, need to create a society and business that can sustain itself for the next 100 years. So to change the subject slightly, Tokyo Marine Nichido includes the next generation as one of the stakeholders for few years ago. We are planning to start a junior, junior internship uh, program for high school students, like a Shinaga Joshi who will be responsible for the next generation. So there are two purposes of these initiatives. Firstly, to give them experience of working for solving social issues through our business activities so that they can realize that the learn, learning is not for the sake of learning. It is for making society better. Mm. So secondary, to utilize the feedback of the younger generation for reviewing our group initiatives and major issues. I believe that uh, companies have fields in which they can contribute to the next generation through this kind of initiative and hope that this junior internship will spread to other Japanese companies as well. Mm. Oh, that's, that's all my That's comment. very inspirational. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And, Nick, you said something uh, important that, you know, there, there used to be in the old days, the, not even the analog, I mean, it's more recent than that, that there was just a focus overwhelmingly on shareholders. And you've begun to shift, many companies have begun to shift to a stakeholder capitalism model that BlackRock, and I know there's a BlackRock um, uh, uh, executive speaking later today, but the shift from an overwhelming focus on investors to focusing on all of a company's stakeholder groups, including employees. Yeah. So I just wanted to circle back to you, yeah. Dana, and just ask, um, you know, do you have any thoughts going back to the workers and the, and yeah. what Nick talked about, about giving them stipends or, mm. you know, making the environment such that you're mobilizing your greatest asset, your, your um, people. Yeah. Well, um, uh, I'm part of the Emerging Leaders Program, and uh, some of you may know we had a fantastic program this week. Um, thanks to Paul Yonamine, we, had, uh, we met with business leaders, um, government leaders um, uh, from Japan, and uh, we had a Harvard professor, Dr. Kach, uh, Takauchi, um, talk to us about the soul of Japan. And this was a distinguishing difference between Japanese companies and American companies. And so it really goes hand in hand with what you were saying. Um, one uh, phrase he used was, all Japanese companies kind of have this value, this shared value. Um, and he translated it as, uh, the sun is watching. It was, otento uh, sama ga mitteru. And it was so powerful. <laughs> it, was, it made me shiver because it's not your shareholders are watching, the press is watching. It's something higher and it's, it, it makes you recognize like what are you doing when no one's watching? 
Um, and so this, uh, what you were saying really made me think about um, actually a very special experience I had um, after the Tohoku um, earthquake. Um, thanks to USJC, I was able to go on the Tomodachi Mitsui Leadership Program, and we met with CEOs um, to talk about, in Japan, about the recovery effort. And uh, I remember someone in our group asked kind of a gotcha question to one of the CEOs and said, what is your, why don't you have an ESG department? What is your ESG philosophy and what was your strategy for your recovery effort? And I'll never forget the response. Um, the, the CEO said, what is ESG? He said, we don't, we don't have a strategy. Our employees lost their homes. They lost their families. They lost all hope. And when that happened, we went out there. We, went, we had search teams looking for them giving them food, finding them home, paying for funerals. We gave them all the time off they needed. And so we don't consult an ESG department. It was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. And it was such a powerful way of thinking about how you do good and such a stark difference to how I think American companies think about ESG and diversity and inclusion efforts, you'll always see it as a separate department. And when I returned back to America, it really got me thinking, you know, as long as it continues to be a separate department, it will always be considered an afterthought. It needs to be ingrained into the DNA. And what Japan has is 20,000 companies that are over 100 years old. That is not a coincidence. The US only has 1,000. And there is something there that we need to learn from. It is so magical. Uh, and so there's some work. Um, Meredith in our ELP program, she's getting her PhD. And she is studying the hard problem of how do you get large operating companies to integrate ESG into their operating models, not advise them on the side. That is a hard thing to do, and it requires a lot of restraint, and it requires a lot of future visioning. And I, I, I've just absorbed so much from CEOs like Nick on how you, it, sometimes I think Japanese companies don't even know how wise they are, because it's so second nature to do the right thing. You know, I've got, what you say resonates so much with me, Dana, coming from Hawaii. Um, that is also a model very similar to Japan. I mean, it's, it's a small island state, and people are always watching in Hawaii. <laughs> Usually you're related to someone that you're doing business with. But because of that, our business leaders in Hawaii really adopt, they have a what we call in Hawaii kuleana, or feel a, a yeah. strong responsibility to their workers mm. and to the community to actively try to solve problems. And I do see that very much in Japan as well. So there is, there is something we should all learn. And the culture change for America has to happen where you don't pat yourself on the back like, I have a good ESG <laughs> program. It's a cultural, it's a mindset shift that you should just do the right thing. So I, I think there's a lot we could be learning on both sides. So I wanted to ask um, Nick and Jasper a question. Um, Nick, I'll start with you. If you were on a selection committee to pick the next leader for your company, what qualities would you consider most essential well, to his or her success? Well, it's a very difficult question. <laughs> we're always thinking about that as a, as a top management. When I was appointed as a general manager, I was told by the CEO at the time that uh, people who do not fully understand our philosophy and culture are not suited for our company. No matter how excellent they are. So in other words, this is a strong message, very strong message that a person who do not have a clear understanding of the company's purpose would never be promoted to a higher position. So I was shocked when I was told from the CEO at that time. However, I realized 
through my experience as CEO that these words are the most essential you know, qualities for leaders. So as I said at the beginning, creating a culture is the most important job for a leader. So in order to do so, the leaders themselves must have a firm understanding of the corporate philosophy and value. And their words and actions must be consistent. In other words, again, tone at the top is critical for any company. So one of the top management of GAFA has also said, number is not our goal. Accomplish the mission is. Number will follow as a result of accomplishing the mission. And every single, every employee has to have a strong sense of mission and purpose that every single job that exists in the operation leads to the corporate mission. Sorry, Jasper and Dina, uh, these words were not uh, were from, uh, you know, Satya Nadira, CEO of Microsoft. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm sure that your CEO is doing the same way. So I believe that uh, revival of Microsoft after a hard time is because of promoting right actions based on deep understanding of mission and purpose. Mm -hmm. And secondary, it is important to understand that work cannot be done alone. That's my own philosophy. The following words are inscribed on the tomb of Andrew Carnegie. You may know about that. Known as Steel King, yes. Here lies a man who was able to surround himself with men for cleverer than himself. Mm. He was a man who knew his limitations, humbly recognized the strengths of his subordinates and made the best use of their strengths. I believe that it is an essential quality for a leader to move followed by uniting the strengths of those around leader. So therefore, as I mentioned a uh, while ago, leaders should lead bottom up, bottom up, by top down. It is about empowering and motivating employees and maximizing their power of self-help and align their growth to that of company. So I believe that these qualities are essential for leaders. Yeah, that's really interesting. You, you're talking about humility, having- That's my belief. Emp empathy and humility. Well, what about you, Jasper? What, what would you look for if you were part of the selection committee? Um, I'll use everything, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think there's a, a lot of wisdom in there, so thank you for sharing. Um, I think the way that I will actually turn that uh, wisdom into the language that we use at Amazon is that, you know, we, we have this whole set of leadership principles that I, I keep talking about the, this morning. Um, but that's something that we actually use uh, for any and all uh, positions within Amazon. So in your question about like, how to actually select the next CEO, uh, we're actually doing that every single day, every single one of us. Uh, and we think about it as part of our job, um, to actually think about how we actually strengthen our own teams. And within that, we use the leadership principle to actually guide us. Uh, in some particular situation, one particular leadership principle may be more important than the other. So, so that's kind of like where we kind of like turn that a little bit uh, uh, forward. But if you actually just kind of like step all the way back to say that if you actually think about what Amazon needs to be doing or what we can we see us doing for the next 20, 30, 50 years, um, the leadership principle actually go on to guide us. But within that, um, there are a few things that we ought to want to call out as well. Um, one is about this whole customer's obsession um, that we want to kind of going back to the next point that you know this whole what the company's purpose is about. Our purpose is to be the, we want to be the earth's most customer centric company. So you know the, the leader absolutely need to understand and kind of like feel like that that's in the DNA to actually move things forward. Um, beyond that, this really kind of like um, I'll write a lot. This is another big one for us. Um, how to actually make good decisions. 
Um, we started this conversation about uh, VOCA, and uh, there's a lot more of these, <laughs> and probably multiple times of this uh, over the next 20, 30 years. Um, so how to actually take all these factors and be able to actually turn them into you know, right decisions for us. Um, and uh, this whole notion about the Earth's best employer, um, how to actually start thinking about our employees um, as kind of like to bring it to the next level of leadership that they can actually bring. Uh, we know that you know, the impact that we want to be making, you know, just kind of like move to uh, the mission that we have. Um, we need a lot more like, you know, big leaders in our place um, and how to actually create the environment that each one of us can be the biggest leader we can be um, and we want to be. And that's the whole notion about like bringing that out uh, into uh, becoming the Earth's uh, best employer. The last but not least is whole, this whole notion about empathy. Um, I think that as we kind of get further out into the future, um, the influence that we have as a company uh, in many facets of the space that we actually operate in, uh, we need to kind of take this notion about empathy to a very different level as well. We have to be a lot more empathetic for our customers, uh, for all of the selling partners that we have, for all the developers that actually work with us, for the employees who actually are part of our teams. Um, to be able to kind of like think about what their needs are and bring all those things into context about what we want to be achieving. Um, I think that if I actually to have to reflect on what the journey has been over the last 25 years, you know, that's, if I had to do one thing over again, it's like this particular piece, that we could actually do a lot more in becoming a more empathetic company. Oh, that's mm -hmm. so interesting. Yeah. Dana, do you have any thoughts on that? Here. I can't top that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I was going to try to take some questions from the audience, but we only have seven minutes. I'm just going to make an executive decision. Since you said I could be bossy, I'm just going to ask my question. I hope that's okay. It's just so interesting. Um, so ESG is driving a shift from fossil fuels um, to slow global warming, but this, per, you know, this is uh, posing enormous financial and operational challenges to all business. And now we have the war in Ukraine um, and the world seems to be heading into recession if it's not already in recession. So can you describe how you and your teams that you work with balance the political, financial, operational, social, regulatory, managerial risk, I mean, go on and on. Well, how are you looking at things in the future? And We'll try to end with that, actually, because I don't. We don't have much time, so I'll go in this order. Okay. Well, um, as I said earlier, that you know, uh, we continue to see this world as being ever changing. Um, every day is a is a different day. Um, so we want to actually be one of the big things that we want to continue to be doing as part of our day one culture is to embrace changes, as opposed to resisting changes. Um, and I think that the more that we can actually lean into these changes and be able to just kind of like uh, change, uh, make the appropriate changes within our own company to actually meet such changes, the better off we will be uh, for the long term. Um, and uh, energy, it's a big deal. Um, and the earth the sustainability is a big deal. Um, so about like two or three years ago, we were actually uh, uh, making sustainability a very important objective of Amazon. Um, we started the Climate Pledge Fund. Um, we actually tried to um, uh, create a goal that we can actually get to zero carbon uh, 10 years before the Paris Agreement uh, that, um, suggested. Um, and all those things are something that we want to actually lean for way out there. Uh, because, you know, just kind of given what, who we are at Amazon, that we think that if we actually kind of get a very, uh, a goal like that, that we can actually create the innovation of kinds that we cannot actually imagine today. And if we can actually bring more people into that uh, thinking, uh, like the Climate Pledge Fund, it's not just about Amazon, we're actually bringing all the greatest companies in the world to actually uh, work with us, uh, work together to actually make this happen for the earth. Um, uh, that we're gonna actually bring up so much, so like innovative power that exists in every single one of us to be actually make this earth a better place for everyone else, for the next, next generations to come. We're very committed to doing that. So there are a lot of short-term things that we need to be doing, like do we actually invest in this versus other things? And that kind of like, we, we want to sort of like be thrilled about the opportunity, about what that can actually offer us for the next 10 years, 20 years, because 
that through innovation, through collective innovation, that we can actually bring the earth to be a better place. That's mm. wonderful. Very well said. Mm. Nick, do you have any thoughts? Yeah. Now, uh, the war in Ukraine has driven up you know, fuel prices. Mm -hmm. Even now, the world appears to be heading into a recession. And first of all, I am deeply saddened that so many innocent Ukrainians have been affected by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and that so many have been forced to flee from their homeland. I hope that the peaceful will come to Ukraine you know, as soon as possible. And climate change is a global challenge that poses risks to the safety and security of our customers and society. The potential for the you know, in intensification and the increased scale and frequency of you know, severe weather and natural disaster poses a direct impact on the, uh, our industry. So this makes climate change a top priority issue that we must address head on, not only for our business, but also in our role as institution investor, institutional investor, and as a global company. So to, this, to, to that end, Tokyo Marine is committed to implementing actions that help transition to decarbonize, decarbonize the society. So, Certainly, uh, the current dependence on fossil fuel is a uh, temporary increasing. But in the mid-term to long term, uh, we will move toward a uh, decarbonized, you know, decarbonized society. So we don't think that simple divestment works to realize uh, you know, decarb decarbonized society. We will have thoroughly, you know, thorough dialogue and engagement with our portfolio companies to confirm stories, how they are trying to contribute to the transition to that society. And then utilize our insurance to encourage risk taking of those companies in order to achieve their goals. So uh, that's all my comment. Very good. Uh, well, this question really resonates with me because in my role, um, mm. th this technology that we're building is so complex. It requires the technology to advance. We need mm. policy to advance as well. We need the operations and the infrastructure to be there, but we also need the community to be okay. And we cannot have any one go ahead of the other or else it all breaks. And so what it makes me think of is uh, the old Japanese saying, you know, the, the, ham the nail that, gets stick that sticks up, you know, must be hammered down. And when I think about, you know, how do we balance all of these competing, sometimes competing interests, uh, my job is overseeing our dense urban market operations and also create, developing the, the tactical strategy on entering new cities and countries. And the only way we do that is I've been drawing from my Japanese values where I understand the power of us all moving as a unit. I cannot have anyone go faster than another. You don't get rewarded. You are leaving someone behind. And so uh, in these moments where um, these are big questions that I don't have enough life experience to answer, but I find myself drawing back to what my mother taught me. Show some restraint. Don't eat that last piece. You know, <laughs> give it to someone else. <laughs> and make sure that no one gets excluded. And I'm so afraid that my company is going to come to Japan and they're going to see everyone does this so much better than me. <laughs> and they will be so unimpressed because <laughs> I'm only half Japanese. But this is ingrained. This is ingrained in our culture. And this is why it's easy. It, 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 this, this is a tall task, but it does not feel hard because I have been raised to meet this challenge, um, and I'm just so grateful for my, for my Japanese heritage to prepare me for this moment. 
I, I don't think there's any chance, Dana, that the, the Google executives or Alphabet executives are going to come and, and see that anyone is better than you. I, I think that's not going to happen. But, you know, I just want to thank all of our panelists, Jasper, Nick, and Dana, for just a very stimulating, thought-provoking conversation. Uh, I think what maybe surprised me the most, even though we spoke ahead of time, is just the human-centeredness of your leadership style. You know, that even though we face immense challenges, and it's scary sometimes, and Dana, you said it, we don't have all the answers, no one does. You know, when I talk to clients, I always talk about before, you know, you were GM and you had an organizational chart and it had, you know, boxes with people and you could categorize every person and department. And today we're operating in what we call this white space where there are no easy answers. And you push on one lever, another lever goes up, another nail. <laughs> so, um, you know, what I do think it requires is people like the three of you, um, you know, different generations of people, but who all share the same philosophy of building a culture, building a team, yeah. leading with empathy. Yeah. And even yeah. though the times ahead it might be rocky and scary, I am so inspired listening to these leaders. I have optimism for the future. I want to be like yeah. you. I'm going to try to be like you. I've taken a lot of notes and I'm going to write them down and try to model your leadership. And I think all of us in the room share that feeling. And I thank you very much for your wisdom you and for your that. insights and your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.